Thank you, Tom. Well, I'd like to add uh, a happy Mother's Day uh, to all of those of you who are out there who are celebrating this day, and also especially to uh, my own mother, Anna, and uh, my beautiful wife, Chris, who is the mother of our three kids sitting there in the front row. Now, from what I hear, rock stars on tour have a hell of a time. They bust up their hotel rooms, they get drunk or high, trash the furniture with their bandmates, party with groupies, but authors on tour are quieter and more solitary souls. Between our appointments, we sit by ourselves in our rooms, nibbling like prairie dogs on room service sandwiches, or ironing our pants for the next reading, or watching Judge Judy. <laughs> Two or three novels ago, I had perhaps my most surreal book tour moment when I was alone in a hotel room in Dayton, Ohio. And while I was channel surfing, I came upon the quiz show Jeopardy at the exact moment my name surfaced. He wrote the novel She's Come Undone, Alex Trebek stated. And in the torturous pause that followed, <laughs> those three contestants stood there lockjawed and mute, itching but unable to press those thumbs to those buzzers. And so sitting on the edge of the bed in room 417 of the Westin Hotel, I uttered in a somewhat sheepish voice, well, who is Wally Lamb? <laughs> For one thing, I'm a School of Education alumnus of this university. I graduated about 40 years ago. And if you graduates today live moderately and practice safe sex and watch your cholesterol and alcohol intakes and obey the rules of the road and the law of averages, you will survive until May 12, 2043, which is 40 years from today. Now, think about that for a moment. Uh, by 20, is it 43 or 53? 43, I guess. Um, the, uh, by, uh, by this time, Iron Man 3 and the Hangover films will be American movie classics. <laughs> Beyonce and Jay-Z will be eligible for the senior citizen discount at Walmart. Honey Boo Boo will be menopausal. <laughs> and Justin Bieber will probably need Viagra. <laughs> now, before my tenure here at UConn, I was a high school student down the road in Norwich, struggling with math, but interested in English and history and biology. My biology teacher, Mrs. Minky, had set up a genetics experiment in which we were to study heredity and characteristic through several generations of a single family of fruit flies. Now, the fruit fly is an ideal subject for this study because of its manic life cycle. If memory serves, I believe it's possible if you're a fruit fly to be born on Monday morning and play with your grandchildren by Thursday afternoon. <laughs> we budding biologists were assigned tasks. Mine was to feed the flies, and so at the end of each school day, I would climb the stairs to the bio lab, open the glass jars that held our populations, drop into each a piece of rotten banana, and then screw the lids closed again. And then after completing my task, I would sometimes put my face to the jar and study for a few minutes the feasting and fornicating that would ensure the continuation of the species. The genetics experiment proceeded on course until the fateful Friday afternoon when I climbed the stairs, opened the jars, dropped in the banana, and then forgot to replace the lids. By Monday, the entire four-story building was infested, and to this day, I have near total recall of the bracing, finger-waving speech Mrs. Minky delivered to me on the subject of scientific responsibility, all the while batting at the fruit flies that swarmed around her. Now, two years later, despite my shortcomings in the life sciences, I found myself in a senior class titled Honors Physiology. It was taught by none other than Mrs. Minky's husband, Mr. Minky. By mid-year, my classmates and I had become so proficient with scalpels and frog innards that we were presented with dead cats, one plastic-bagged corpse for each future physiologist. These specimens were expensive, Mr. Minky told us, as he yanked one stiff feline after another out of a big plastic barrel and presented them to us like awards. These cats have cost the school a lot of money, he said. Our having them was an honor. 
I remember unsheathing my body-bagged cat and staring down in fear and horror. Its fur was pungent with formaldehyde. Its teeth and claws were bared, and it had died mouth open as if in mid-howl. <laughs> it was a, sheer study in t a study in sheer terror, in the instinct not to die, and it was mine for the rest of the semester. The following year, as a college freshman here at UConn, I would sit in a darkened history class and watch black and white footage of blank-faced, naked corpses being bulldozed by the Nazis into a communal pit. And that same semester, across campus in a darkened art appreciation classroom, I would get my first glimpse projected from a slide onto a screen of Edvard Munch's famously disturbing painting, The Scream. And to this day, I see that trio of images superimposed. The face of my dead cat, stiff and supine before me on the lab table, the death masks of Hitler's victims, and the visage of the tortured soul in Munch's painting, who stands, his hands slapped against his face, and screams in horror at, at what? Death? The 20th century? Life? The 21st century? Now, Mr. Minky was a coffee drinker, and he was a man of misplaced faith. As we were in honors class, he made the assumption that we would act honorably whether he was in the room or not. And so it was his practice to leave us for long stretches of time with our dead cats and our worksheets and stroll down to the teacher's room while we engaged in higher level scholarship. But we weren't honorable. We were kids, irresponsible, and I see now in retrospect intimidated by all that rigor mortis around us all those silent screams of death, and so in fear, we, co we groped for comic relief. And it was I who proposed the idea of staging a mock wedding. To my surprise, the concept caught on, and my peers and I abandoned honor and scholarship and the feline circulatory and digestive systems, and we threw our energies into the surreal nuptials to come. That Friday, Mr. Minky left class on schedule at the beginning of the hour, and with the coast clear, we dressed our corpses in their makeshift tuxedos and gowns. Karen Barbarossa's cat was the bride, Jimmy Bradley's was the groom, and Connie Balecki had baked brownies for the reception. I think somebody brought Fritos, too. I was the officiating man of God, and unwisely I was performing the ceremony with my back to the door when all around me, my classmates' eyes dropped to the floor and our cats thunked back down against the lab tables because Mr. Minky had made an unscheduled appearance, had crashed the wedding pr to propose the philosophical question, who started this foolishness? <laughs> and so, with two scientific strikes against me and the blessings of both Mr. and Mrs. Minky, I gave up my future brilliant career in life science and became instead first an English teacher and later a fiction writer, still examining life, of course, but doing so without cadavers and sharp instruments. Ah, life. I think when you boil human existence down to the bare bones, reduce it to the lowest common denominator, what it comes down to, maybe, is that we are governed by three basic instincts. One, the need to find food so that we won't starve. Two, the need to satisfy our sex drive so that we won't become extinct. And three, the need to understand and interpret the world around us on some intellectual level, to live deliberately, as Thoreau put it while he was gazing out on the waters of Walden Pond. And it's that third impulse, our hungering to figure out the world, that distinguishes us from the, the lowly fruit fly and the instinct-driven cat, and thus, Unlike these simpler life forms, we scratch the skulls that house our sizable brains, and we think. We read books, visit museums, rent movies, go to sports events, surf the web. We pray to God for grace and guidance, or declare that God is non-existent. We go to college, where we write, read, absorb, analyze, articulate, demonstrate, experiment, and emerge from the process educated because we hunger to understand the world and our place in it. And at times, 
understanding the world, making order out of chaos, seems insurmountable. I mean, how could the Holocaust have happened? Why do disease and racism and homophobia still exist? Why does hunger live in the belly of a Haitian child, or for that matter, a kid in Willimantic or Hartford or your hometown? What did those brothers imagine that they could accomplish by detonating pressure cooker bombs for the purpose and ki of killing and maiming innocent bystanders on that celebratory sunny day? You know, if there is a God out there, then why all this suffering? These are tough questions, unanswerable most of them, no matter what your major happened to be. And yet we grope, we struggle, to understand, and that struggle, I believe, is what makes us human, and it can become a noble one when accompanied by a rejection of the unacceptable status quo and an effort to change things for the better. But how to improve this imperfect world? That question has occupied the minds of scholars and scientists and artists and activists throughout time and has sometimes been the pebble in the shoe that becomes the unbearable pain that motivates good minds and generous hearts to bring their gifts to the table and fix things. And that, by your engagement with the teaching profession, is what you're doing. You're chipping away at inequality, and indifference, and insensitivity, and illiteracy, and step by step in both ways, in ways both measurable and unmeasurable, you are taking your best shot at fixing things. It's what we teachers do. And make no mistake about it, teaching is tough, as challenging and selfless and weekend swallowing and all consuming as it is rewarding. The need for subsistence, the need to satisfy our sex drive, and the need to figure out the world and our place in it. It was the Danish philosopher theologian Soren Kierkegaard who observed one of the central ironies of human existence, that life can only be, be lived forward, but understood backward. And let me go back then to when I was an undergraduate here at UConn between the years 1968 and 1972. And I tell you, those were turbulent and seductive times. It was an era in which world politics and cultural sea changes invited baby boomers like me to fight for social justice and party hardy. The sexual revolution had arrived and marijuana per perfume smoked, uh, I'm sorry, marijuana smoke perfumed the dorm. The Vietnam War and the civil rights battle intensified and the soundtrack of those years segued from this is the dawning of the age of Aquarius to by the time we got to Woodstock we were half a million strong to tin soldiers and Nixon coming were finally on our own. Prepare yourself for the real world? <laughs> Shit, we were gonna fix it. <laughs> I'm on strike, I told my father over the phone after the invasion of Cambodia and the killings at Kent State. The hell you are, he shouted back into the receiver. You get to class. But Richard Nixon and my dad were more or less interchangeable that spring. And so I hung up the phone on the old geezer, stuck my fist in the air and joined the protest. And at the end of my four, wild four-year ride at Yukon, I did not launch myself into the chaotic world at large. Large, No, I took a U-turn, returning to Norwich to teach English at the high school from which I had graduated. My first classes were the ones that no other teacher wanted, comprised of students who had been retained so many times that several of them were my age, 21. The sweat hogs, they were fond of calling themselves. My plan was to win them over by releasing them from the prison that school had been until I had gotten there. I would open their minds by making their education relevant. And so the sweat hogs and I honeymooned for about a week, I think it was, until the day when I approached Seth Jinks, a surly senior, and I asked him to take his head off the desk and pay attention. He worked nights, and so Seth slept at school during the day. He raised his head, as I had asked, opened his bloodshot eyes and said, why don't you go, why don't you go, 
well, this being a commencement address, I don't want to be indelicate. So let's just say that Seth suggested in a profane way that I engage myself in an activity that more commonly involves two people. <laughs> when they're naked. <laughs> the class and I held our collective breath. I had no idea how to respond to this. And though the School of Ed had prepared me well, they had not prepared me for this. But then mercifully, Seth unfolded his long legs, stood, and he ambled voluntarily out the door and up to the principal's office, thereby saving my teaching career. And so I remained at that school for the next 25 years. Now, about nine years into my tenure there, without premeditation, I sat down one day and I began to write fiction. This was during the summer of 1981, the exact same month that Jared, the first of our three sons, was born. Jared, who, when he was a toddler and I had just found out that my first short story was going to be published, I picked up and tossed in the air so exuberantly that his head hit the kitchen ceiling. <laughs> oh, not to worry. Our kitchen at the time had one of those drop ceilings with the acoustic foam panels. And so Jared didn't clunk his head. It just disappeared for a few seconds <laughs> and then came back into view. Jared, who one time when he was a high school senior, I overheard complaining about the old geezer. I looked around to see if my father had come. <laughs> but no, he meant me. But at any rate, in ways that I have never fully understood, teaching and fatherhood and fiction writing are entwined at the roots. You know, sometimes when you write and publish books, you get writing back. 30 years and five novels into my writing life, I now have several plastic bins overflowing with reader mail, and a lot of it is in response to my first novel, She's Come Undone, and its wounded but undefeated protagonist, Dolores. I treasure all my letters, but my very favorite remains one that I received within the first year of the book's publication from a seriously, Ill mental, uh, ser seriously mentally ill young man, a guy who was a cutter, and who had repeatedly tried to relieve his pain through self-mutilation. Here's an excerpt from that letter. He wrote, Now, I didn't write to bear my soul or anything, Mr. Lamb, but when I was an inpatient at the Institute of Living for two and a half years, I read a lot and I thought a lot, and one of my ridiculous fantasies with it was that if I were ever to have a literary character dinner party, I would invite being 27 but still pathetically immature, Salinger's Holden Caulfield, and Hemingway's Jake Barnes and Kate Chopin's Edna Pontillier and John Updike's Rabbit Angstrom, the younger one, not the older one. What I wanted to tell you is that I'm extending an invitation to Dolores for that dinner party. You know, I wasn't fat as a kid, like she was, but I, when I got to the Institute of Living and they hit me with Thorazine, et cetera, et cetera, suddenly now I weigh over 100 pounds more than I did in college. And though I never tried to drown myself like Dolores did, I was a razor man. The scene with the dead whale was amazing. I felt like she was fighting my fight. And when that circle of bubbles uh, comes up at the end, I felt happy for her and really lifted. So thank you for writing your book. And please give my love to Dolores. Shalom, David F. And P.S. Doesn't it piss you off when people buy a book by Millie the Dog or Rush Limbaugh, when they could just be making friends for life if they met Dolores? I don't know. I was sure it was going to be a bestseller. Fuck them. <laughs> so as you see, I dropped the F-bomb anyway. <laughs> David's letter made me laugh and cry, as Dolores herself had done while I was discovering her story. And so I did a little detective work. And against all the odds, even in those pre-HIPAA law days, I found out his last name. And I got a hold of his telephone number. And I called him up to thank David for his brave and amazing letter and to tell him that I thought that he, too, should maybe pursue writing. He sounded painfully shy, shocked to have heard back from me. And when I said I hoped to meet him someday, he told me apologetically that although he'd like to meet me, too, he could never handle an encounter like that. That initial exchange began a letter-writing friendship that exists to this day, 20 years later. You know, way back in 1981, the year I became a father and a fiction writer, 
I could never have predicted all that has come to pass, good and bad. My two rides on the Oprah's Book Club roller coaster, my two-year teaching stint here at UConn, and my 14 years and counting volunteer teaching at York Prison for Women. I could not have predicted the Columbine and 9-11 and Sandy Hook tragedies, or the rise of the e-book and the decline of the printed one, or stores downtown for that matter. Today, that toddler that I tossed into the air upon learning that my short story was good enough to be published is the same age that I was back then. Jared is now the 31-year-old principal of the New Orleans Leadership Academy, a KIPP charter school that he established for storm-tossed inner-city kids in the wake of Hurricane Katrina. As I could not have imagined all of the above, neither could I have predicted what happened one winter evening in 2008, shortly before my third novel, The Hour I First Believed, was published. I was reading from the book in front of a large and affable crowd at the Mermaid Bar, a downtown New Haven watering hole. And when I finished the Q&A and was getting ready to leave, a handsome and healthy looking guy in his early 40s came up to me and he said, hey Wally, it's me. I wanted you to know that I took your advice. I've just enrolled in an MFA in writing program so that I can tell my story. And standing before me was my pen pal of the past 16 years, David F., David Fitzpatrick. Miraculously, the right combination of therapy and psychotropic meds and altered brain chemistry had allowed David to emerge at long last from the mental illness that had oppressed him and taken him out of the world. I've met a wonderful woman on eHarmony, he told me. Amy and I are engaged. And last year, my wife Chris and I attended their wedding, a joyous and triumphant celebration if ever there was one. And a few months after that, I read the galley of David's memoir about his harrowing journey into madness and his subsequent return to sanity. David's book, titled Sharp, was published at about the same time as the 20th anniversary edition of She's Come Undone. Over at the Yukon Co-op, those books sit in different sections, fiction and nonfiction. But occasionally, I grab a copy of one and slide it next to the other as a symbol of how miraculous and wonderfully unpredictable teaching and life are and can be, especially if the teacher loves above all else, including the subject matter, the learner who is engaged in the act of opening his or her mind. Because make no mistake about it, the bottom line is that teaching is an act of love. And against all adversity, it's love that wins. And so graduates, to help you cross the finish line of your Yukon career, and move to the starting line of the next phase of your lives, I've come here this morning to offer you a modest gift, which is to say that we have now reached the old geezer portion of the address in which longevity seeks to impart wisdom to youthful exuberance. So here are five things that this teaching writer and dad has come to know. One, in teaching as in writing and life, voice is crucial. Your voice has been honed by your family, your ethnicity, your neighborhood, your era, and your schooling. It is the music of what you mean in the world. Imitate no one else. Your uniqueness, your authenticity is your strength. Two, make yours a life story which is driven not by plot, but by character. Character being defined as the way you behave when there is no one else in the room to judge you. Don't fear that silent room. Your solitude will guide you if you remain strong of character. Number three, learn to love revision. Listen to the feedback of others, welcome it with gratitude and humility. Make mistakes, lots of them, reworking the draft after draft of your continuing teaching and life story your errors will be educational, and if your pencil outlives its eraser, you will know that you're getting it right. Number four, 
never underestimate the value of comic relief. We live in unsettling times, terrorism, bigotry, global warming, an unstable world economy. These are not laughing matters, and yet laughing matters. Laughter is a way by which we can defy gravity even on the gravest of teaching days. And finally, five, regarding plot, the twists and turns and episodes of your life. Outline as much or as little as you like, plan as much as you want to, but expect surprises. In fact, invite surprises. Because each time you begin some next chapter of your life, your composition of yourself will be at risk. But that's OK. That's good because you will not live fully if you never displace yourself. The novelist E.L. Doctorow once said, writing a novel is like driving a car at night. You may be able to see only as far as your headlights, but you can make the whole trip that way. And so that's it. Once again, happy Mother's Day to all the moms, and especially congratulations to you graduates. And if you remember nothing else of what I've said here this morning, please remember this simple two-syllable message. Love wins. Thank you.